Riley, a recovering drug addict, now living under the roof of her overprotective brother, Matt, who is best described as not exactly optimistic of her chances for a full recovery, returns home one night with her new boyfriend, Trevor, another equally damaged addict whom she met in a 12-step program. Breaking the number one rule of recovering addict, never get involved with another addict, as this leads to codependent relationship and ultimate destruction for all involved. This is a huge red flag to Matt, Matt's live-in boyfriend, and most of Riley's friends. Thus, setting up the main themes of our story and the relationship between our main characters, Riley and Trevor. In this new take on the Hellraiser series, our lead character, Riley, is once again drawn down a dark path by boyfriend Trevor, who claims to have a foolproof plan of striking it rich and, at least for the time being, fixing all of their problems. Spoken like a true addict. This idea involves breaking into this warehouse and into this billionaire art collector's private safe in the hopes of making a quick and easy score, enabling Riley and Trevor to continue to follow down this never-ending path of destruction. As if to say, hey, I just discovered this new high, do you want to try it? We can do it together, it'll be okay. I found this a fairly entertaining setup and was interested in seeing where the filmmakers were going to take this and use subtext as a tool to push an interesting twist in the series. Already, we see a parallel between this character Riley and Uncle Frank from the original 1987 classic Hellraiser. These characters cannot help themselves as they are compelled to follow this dark path that they know will ultimately destroy them. For Riley and Uncle Frank, both characters are sloths, drifters, drug addicts, looking for that next high. That next realm of physical, mental, and emotional fulfillment that they simply cannot satisfy in this world. When all you know is pain and destruction, it becomes what drives you. Sometimes you seek it out. What this new installment tries to do, and this just could be my opinion, is create an allegory between Riley's desire to abuse drugs and her loved one's inability to understand or accept her conscious choice to self-destruct. Throughout the first act of this new Hellraiser, Riley is suspected of killing her brother after she unwittingly opens the lament configuration box and her brother is taken by the Cenobites. He just ups and disappears after the two of them have a blow-up fight that leads to the brother throwing Riley out on her butt for good. So she's running around trying to explain what's happened to her brother, and of course no one believes a word of her fantastical story. She's an addict and a proven liar with questionable judgment whose mind has been poisoned by drugs. So, without the support of her friends, Riley is forced to venture off on her own to investigate and eventually discover the secrets of the Lament Configuration puzzle box. There are six gates in this lament configuration. Life, knowledge, love, resurrection, sensation, power. Whoever can open all six sides of the configuration will be granted a pass to come before Leviathan, or the god of the underworld. They'll be given a choice in granting one of these six desires. In the original installments of the Hellraiser series, there comes a point when certain characters have to offer a blood sacrifice to the Cenobites and ultimately to this god Leviathan. The character Roland Voigt, played by ER's Dr. Luka Kovacs himself, Warren Visionick, is obsessed with opening all six gates and being granted this ultimate desire. Of course, he isn't interested in giving over his soul to the Cenobites and being ripped to pieces, so he figures out a way to lure other victims into his trap that will ultimately finish this puzzle box and grant him access. This movie does a good job of explaining key plot points better than any other film in the series as if to make up for some of the plot issues of Hellbound Hellraiser 2, where there was almost an intriguing premise, but not quite. Anyways, Riley, like most addicts, is looking for fulfillment in that instant high, believing in that moment she will reach some new level of consciousness and filling whatever void in her life she feels is missing. The puzzle box here is a symbol of Riley's desire to use and abuse drugs. In the end, she will have to face the choice of life over death, or relinquishing the puzzle box over to the Cenobites. As if relinquishing a dirty needle, or pills, or whatever drugs she had previously been abusing. There's symbolism here that the filmmakers are toying with. These underlying themes were fairly obvious to me early on in the film, as this ending wasn't much of a surprise. But I think they are still handled well here, and at least made the movie a sight more thought-provoking than some of the later installments of the series. Warren Vishnick's character tells Riley, I chose sensation as my ultimate desire, to experience something else this present world hadn't offered me. But he warns Riley, all the Cenobites truly have to offer is pain. It's all a trick. 
really sums up the subtext and themes of this latest installment. You think drugs and alcohol will bring you fulfillment? Don't be fooled. It's all a trick. Continuing down this path will lead to nothing but pain and destruction. Other than this truly heavy-handed subtext, the movie consists of wall-to-wall repetitive scenes of creepy Cenobites walking slowly down creepy, darkly lit hallways, while characters scream and curse and run in opposite direction. While others are pierced or ripped apart by chains that seemingly come from nowhere. Nothing really new here. It's just fodder for fans of the early Hellraiser movies. It's like the best of Hellraiser in Hellraiser 2, mixed with some car chases and action sequences from the earlier Phantasm movies. To the point that I felt like I was watching the original Phantasm. That's sort of satisfying for nostalgia's take, but unlike those movies, the photography here is actually terrible. The look of the first two Hellraiser films were its strongest selling point. But this movie is far too dark, to the point that I had to constantly rewind the film over and over because I felt like I had missed something. I really had trouble seeing what was going on during most of the second act. It wasn't until the third act kicked in that I could focus on what was actually happening on screen without squinting my eyes or pressing pause on the remote. And the fact this isn't shot on film, you lose the grain and contrast of shadows and light you get from the original that made it so special. This is a very crisp and clean looking image, and you do lose that nostalgia factor of growing up on the original movies. They just had that special look to them. I can say that the dialogue during the last 25 minutes or so did hold my attention and was much more thoughtful and much smarter than the first hour of this film would lead you to believe. Watching Gore and Visionick's journey come to a most consequential end was extremely satisfying and interesting. Like I said, the subtext is a bit heavy-handed, but what this movie does right, where the other sequels failed, is that it all makes perfect sense in the end. There's a story here with beginning, middle, and end, not just a geek show of special effects with scary monsters filling the screen. It leaves you scratching your head and asking why. That's how I felt watching Hellraiser 2 and 3. You just get lost trying to follow the plots of those movies. This was much more fleshed out and easier to follow. A big negative for me, this series continues to keep Pinhead to an absolute minimum as far as screen time. I think they're doing the fans a disservice by going that direction. There's some strong dialogue here from Jamie Clayton, as well as a really fantastic screen presence. It's her interactions and exchanges with the various characters here that are the strongest and most interesting elements of this movie. If they were to move forward with the series, I'd seriously consider scrapping the endless chase scenes and torture porn and focus more on subtext and the motivations of these characters that are leading them to seek out this puzzle box of desires. The filmmakers need to have more faith and intelligence of their audience and understand that in order to continue with the franchise, now that it's a straight-to-streaming thing, you need to take a full advantage of your strongest elements and not worry about creating that blockbuster geek show of nonstop violence and destruction that pre-COVID days used to fill our theaters. To me, Pinhead will always be the strongest and most interesting element to the series and needs to be first and foremost your central focus. I think they have a goldmine here if they focus more on dialogue and the underlying subtext of character motivations. Let Pinhead really get inside these people's heads and rely on that tension and personal torment of these characters. There's hints of that here, but should have been so much more. Still, I give Hellraiser 2022 two and a half out of five stars. I enjoyed it about the same as Hellbound, and it was a much stronger effort than Hell on Earth and Bloodline. Drop your thoughts and comments below, and I'll be looking forward to reading them. Take care.